everybody welcome we're so grateful um, that you're joining us tonight this is the capstone presentation and curriculum fair for an amazing working group of 15 uh, k-12 teachers from connecticut along with five high school students called teaching the history and legacies of the eugenics movement we were listening to sweet honey in the rock uh ella's song the uh the fantastic civil rights movement uh, a cappella group and the lyrics for that song are based on um, the words and insights of the great organizer Ella Baker who often stressed the need to reproduce knowledge teaching is central to forms of building um, social justice and social change and that's very much at the heart of the work you'll hear more about today just want to quickly I'll uh, show you what we have in uh, plan for the program I very quickly want to thank the uh, sponsors who made this possible. Um, this is sponsored by the Black and Latino History Project, which includes, and we'll hear more from the coordinator of that project, Tom Thurston from the Gilda Lehrman Center, um, to support uh, K-12 teachers in Connecticut teaching on a broad range of issues related to race and anti-racism. Uh, we want to thank our partners at UConn um, El Instituto, the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective, uh, Connecticut Humanities, who is sponsoring all of this, and the amazing teachers and facilitators who made this group possible. Uh, my name is Dan Hosang. I'm a ethnic studies professor and a teacher educator uh, at Yale, and I also work with the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Co uh, Collective, which is a group of teachers and teacher educators based in Connecticut. Um, tonight, uh, I'm going to do a very, very short uh, introduction to kind of frame a little bit about what the working group um, uh, members uh, uh, thought about, worked on, uh, engaged with, uh, and then we'll get to hear their lessons. We're going to do this in four rounds. We've divided each of the participants into four groups who are working with a facilitator, um, and I'll uh, each of the uh, facilitators will introduce those members, and we'll wrap up right by eight. I'll just say here, we're looking at a, a quilt um, by Judy Dow, who's an Abenaki French Canadian educator and artist. Um, and I just included this because it reminds us that anti-eugenics work is actually flourishing now. There's been a, 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 a very, very significant movement in, on scholarship, activism, reproductive justice work that's really recognized that eugenics practices, research, advocacy wasn't just something in the dustbin of history it has a long long legacy it has an afterlife as we've uh, talked about it at our institution at yale and one of our um challenges obligations and opportunities is to think about how this history of eugenics um both impacts our current moment and to imagine new futures and so this on this quilt it reminds us anti-eugenics is the collective creation of an equitable and healthy world for all. So that's what we have uh, in store. I wanna just uh, say a quick word to help kind of ground us 
kind of why uh, histories of eugenics and why Connecticut. Um, what we're looking at here, you can actually only see the left side, and I'm just going to do this for a minute or two, uh, is a picture of the New Haven Green in 1919. And that building on your right, um, this is a couple of blocks away from Yale University, um, was headquarters of an organization called the American Eugenic Society in the 1920s and 1930s. Yale faculty um, led this organization, hosted its presence in New Haven and on Yale, and really were central to its um, very, very ambitious national organizing. So let's just say a couple of things. So 185 Church Street, for those based in New Haven and Connecticut, was their headquarters. Uh, Yale uh, economics professor Irving Fisher was a major, major leader in bringing this organization to New Haven and to campus. Madison Grant, a Yale alumni, uh, from the class of 1887, who wrote perhaps the most influential white supremacist track of the 20th century, The Passing of the Great Race, was one of its early champions and a member of its steering committee. These are examples of the uh, many public education projects that this organization engaged in. This is uh, Fisher writing to colleagues all over the country to create a kind of academic steering committee. Um, they really, really wanted the authority and legitimacy of the university and attach it to eugenics, uh, this burgeoning eugenics movement. Um, and he wrote, America needs to protect herself against indiscriminate immigration, criminal degenerates, and race suicide. The time is ripe for a strong public movement to stem the tide of threatened racial degeneracy. So this was the founding statement of the American Eugenic Society, and to emphasize that many, many dozens of uh, Yale faculty and uh, other people in New Haven played a role in its development. Uh, we're looking at here are three photos of uh, 14 years after its founding, uh, uh, members of its um, kind of board of directors. So uh, Irving Fisher, a geography professor named Ellsworth Huntington, and the dean of the medical school, Milton Winternitz. This is just two more slides here, a graphic produced by Dora Guo, who was one of the teacher facilitators that um, uh, lists some, but certainly not all, of the different uh, faculty, administrators, organizations that were connected to eugenics and conducted research at Yale. You can see it involves the medical school, pediatrics, the Center for Child Development, the nursing um, school, anthropology, psychobiology, uh, the School of Forestry um, and various institutes started. So this was wide, widespread. In many ways, Yale was not unique. You, there's similar stories that are told about Stanford, Caltech, Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, um, but they, uh, Yale did play a foundational and kind of understudied um, role in this. Um, again, more examples of public information displays that were disseminated all over the country um, by leaders of the American Eugenic Society. Um, I'll just this last side that, you know, eugenics had a, a, a violent and enduring impact on residents in Connecticut. Um, an involuntarily ster involuntary sterilization law was adopted, proposed by eugenics advocates and adopted in 1909. It became the third state in the country to pass such legislation. 600 people in Connecticut at least were involuntarily sterilized, sterilized without their consent, uh, more than 60,000 nationally, um, 20,000 of those in the state of California. In 1936, Connecticut Governor Wilbur Cross uh, commissioned something called the Survey of the Human Resources of Connecticut, um, which set out to survey all of the state's population in order to classify it into um, adequate and inadequate, uh, socially adequate and socially defective. And the study claimed and concluded that 5% of the state's population was socially inadequate. And among the proposals, in addition to sterilization, was actually euthanasia as a potential solution. I want to say this is part of our history. It's understudied. It's difficult history to reckon with. But it reminds us that uh, education, knowledge production, universities were not indifferent, objective, stood on the sidelines when it comes to questions of racial power and hierarchy. They were central to producing this knowledge and these practices. And those of us who inhabit educational institutions and classrooms today um, have an obligation and opportunity both to make this history visible and to think about its legacies and how we move past it to create a more just and equitable world. So um, with that, I'm going to turn now to um, uh, the first fantastic, fantastic group of teachers we had an opportunity to work with, 
we did three sessions together on Zoom, and we did a session in manuscripts and archives where the participants had a chance to look through uh, a broad, broad range of historical documents, um, ephemera, materials. Um, related to this history of eugenics and think about how it could be incorporated. Um, so I'm really pleased to, um, we're going to hear from uh, Carolyn Streets, Colleen Simon, Eden Stein, and then a, a recording from another teacher who couldn't be with us, Shannon Andros. Um, Liz Mancini was also in our group, won't be presenting today, um, but I I'm just want to emphasize how excited I was to work with all these teachers. Uh, Carolyn, are you there? Carolyn. I'm here. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. All right, Carolyn. So, Carolyn, I have your slides. You're going to just let me know um, when to advance them. Uh, Carolyn's a middle school teacher at ESOMS um, in New Haven. Um, Carolyn, welcome. Uh, what do you got for us? Thank you. So that obligation that you just mentioned, if you can start the slides. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that you just mentioned is going to be seen in the work that I'm doing with um, the National Humanities Center, and this is their summer seminar. I also did their winter seminar. Um, this summer center um, summer seminar is um, entitled "Recentering the Narrative: Black Women's Voices of the 19th and 20th Centuries." And my role is to teach the um, pedagogical piece. It's primarily going to consist uh, of um, middle and secondary teachers, mostly secondary teachers. So um, if you can just go to the, that's not the first slide. Can we go to the first slide? So, oh, you just passed it. Yes, so we're going to look, we're going to examine the next one where you were. That has the graphic. The timeline. Sorry. Uh, That's okay. Yeah. That one? Yes. Right. So we're going to um, critically examine how Black women are not a monolith, but yet as a group, we sit at various intersections, and that speaks to Crenshaw's work on intersectionality of targeted systems of oppression. So specifically, when we talk about race and gender, we have to have conversations about um, the historically rooted racial ideologies that either produce or reproduce reproductive violence against Black women. Um, they corrode their autonomy and they restrict their agency over their own bodies. So part of the seminar we'll be looking at, if, if you look at the graphic to the right, if you can see it, we start from um, the historical timeline and eugenics um, is about 170 years of that timeline. And we talk about how Black women are um through the course of the early 19th century. So starting from the Mammy caricature from Jezebel to Sapphire. Um, it's important to, for everyone to understand that the work is to understand that Black women are not the work of oppression, but that of epistemology, Black womenist epistemology. And that means we must understand how these oppressive systems favor or work against the status of African-American women, how African-American women orient themselves to those forces and how all of us can work within these systems to mobilize for social change. And next slide, please. Another part of the seminar will um, talk about the colonial roots of racial fetishization of Black women. Um, TED Talk, TED Ed has a great TED Talk on what eugenics is. Um, so we're in addition to watching that video, we're going to understand that this is European imperialist narrative that encouraged the sexual exploitation of Black women. It engenders the perception of Black women as byproducts of the manifest destiny. And even today, Black female bodies continue to experience the disproportionate rates of sexual exploitation and, and abuse. And such continued practice is rooted in that colonial imperialistic framework that's maintained through historical reproductive control and hypersexualization. So racial fetalization is the practice of reproductive and sexual management that began in the slave era and has been reproduced in policy and societal norms throughout all of American history. And we saw that when um, we were doing our work um, through each of our seminars, and especially um, when we went into the manuscripts, one of the things that I said going through the, those documents is that I'm struck by the politeness and the violence of their language. So we know that 
um, eugenics is not just about um, African American women, but for this particular seminar, that's what we're focusing on. But from the kidnapping of Native American children for white families to acts of abuse against black slaves by white slave owners, we know that people of color have repeatedly have had their reproductive rights violated. Can we go to the next slide, please? Part of the work of the seminar will um, include looking at primary documents. Um, so um, the argument about Sanger, I saw someone put in the chat asking the question about Sanger. Um, I don't know the answer to that, maybe someone else does, but we look at Sanger and the Negro Project and how that project was strongly um, influenced by the eugenics movement and the prof progressive welfare programs of the New De Deal era. Um, it was also largely supported by um, uh, African-American thought leaders of that time, such as Du Bois, um, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, you can see there. Um, but that project is indifferent to the needs of the Black community and constructed in terms and with perceptions that today smack of racism. So we are gonna get into um, those primary documents, the 1919 circular letter from Stanger to W.E.B. Du Bois asking for financial support and looking at a document um, written by Du Bois himself supporting the Negro Project. So this is in reverence to our time that we spent at the um, manuscript. And we're going to use this work to do um, pedagogy pod is just a fancy way of saying group work. So our, our group work is going to be critiquing how do we reproduce or produce those narratives or anti-narratives in response to the reductive ways that rep repressive ideologies work against Black women. So if we have time, Professor Hosang, if we can click, um, some of those links should be clickable if we want to just quickly see what those um, documents look like. Uh I hope. Well, yeah, we might not, Carol. We might not be able to do it because it'll switch us off the um, okay point onto there. So, uh, do you want to describe them quickly, or just to say a last word about that? Yeah. So one of one of the doc. If you can go back to that slide quickly, one of the documents is Du Bois basically writing a letter to the larger community about supporting um, the Negro Project and. The, um, the document number one, the 1990 letter, is basically a document from Sanger who, you know, she wrote to Du Bois saying, hey, we have this project, we want to mobilize you and other thought leaders of the time to support it. Um, the fact that it was supported is just, for me, outlandish, but that's a whole nother conversation about patriarchy and, you know, <laughs> other stuff. So um, we're going to, as part of this seminar, look at those documents to be able to make those critiques. Great. Um, Carolyn, uh, thanks so much for this. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really uh, struck by just the complexity and breadth of all these, you know, we're talking about intersectionality, histories of patriarchy, the ways they shape the formation of race. And I know you're also very attentive to questions of resistance, uh, broad kind of horizons beyond what's imposed here. So mm -hmm. grateful, grateful for this work and really look forward to hearing about its uh, your first uh, use of it. Thank you. Thanks, okay, great. Um, all right, uh, we're going to move on now and welcome Colleen. Um, Colleen, to turn on your camera um, and walk us through this lesson. Um, I want to uh, remind folks you're welcome to put uh, questions, comments, observations in the chat, um, and we'll do our best to respond to them. Colleen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. All right. Uh, how are you, Colleen? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> good, good. So uh, do you want to walk us, Colleen, through maybe just say a, a, a sentence or two about where you teach uh, the overview of the unit, and then we'll, we'll, I'll get the slides up to um, the kind of part that you'll Okay, that's, that's a perfect place to start. Yeah. So um, like, um, I'm Colleen Simon, and I, my lesson is for a very different audience. I teach at a Jewish day school in West Hartford, and I teach middle school humanities. And um, when I went into this um, program and this project, what I, I found very interesting was I discovered a man named um, William Nussbaum. And also um, these were some of the primary documents that were put up for our use. And I was struck by this, um, said, what is a godly um, heritage or what? And so, and I also teach immigration. And 
So the question, what I came when I discovered Nussbaum was, what if I don't have a godly heritage? Looking at those people who might not fit into this um, norm or this perfect norm that was described by the um, eugenicists. So um, Dr. Hosang, if you go sure. to almost the very end, um, yeah. cause that's, again, that's all like background information, because like I said, I, I, I'll be teaching for a much younger audience. And so that is um, William Nussbaum. And as it says there, he was a, um, well, highly trained German Jewish physician. He was from Germany and he worked in heredity physical anthropology by trade. He was, or by training, he was a gynecologist. He was a medical doctor. Many of the um, eugenicists of Germany at the time, and especially some of the Jewish um, eugenicists were doctors. And he basically studied under some of the proponents that wound up working with the Nazis to develop the final solution. Um, but what he was trying to do was prove that um, Jews were not a separate race, but that they were part of Europe. They'd been in Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years and that they, they weren't different. And he was allowed to conduct his research up until about 1935. He um, had measured about 1500 children. And what's interesting is that some of the famous pictures you see of people having their noses measured or their, their heads measured, some of the pictures that have gotten into circulation are Dr. Nussbaum's photographs. And some people take issue with that because they say he was doing the measuring for a different reason. But again, I think that would be a really good place to debate. He's still looking into this uh, methodology, but um, he was shut down by the Nazis. He's invited to come to Columbia University in 1935, working for another anthropologist who does not believe in eugenics. And um, But his wife and children are are still in in Germany. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. And so I just want to show he was also a poet and a, an artist. That's his self portrait that he did of himself. So he was um, obviously much older. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is just a, a lot of information. And this is really the crux of where um, the lesson we'll look at. So he did found um, an organization, the Organization for Jewish Genetic Research and Eugenics. And he was published and, you know, he had this, he, he had interviewed and he had measured and he had looked at about 1500 Jewish children. Um, and again, he left in 1935, but he, the, you know, questions are why did the why were the Nazis why did they tolerate him? Because Hitler comes to power in 1933. That's the year he starts his program. Why is he allowed to work for a couple of years? And there's different theories. Some people think it's because um, they could use the information. He was going to have a list of Jewish children. He was going to have a list of all these different things. But he never gives up this information. He takes it with him when he leaves Germany. Um, but he has two children: his oldest son Bernard, and then he has a son Michael. And Michael um, was born in 1935. So he's an infant when his father leaves, but he has an arm, as it's described, it stops at his elbow. So he um, basically has one functioning arm. But um, so Nussbaum leaves in 35, his wife um, Lottie and his son Bernard come in 1936 and um, Nussbaum is, you know, his wife, they can't, they go to the American consulate, they won't grant Michael a visa to come to the United States because of his arm. And so after much um, talking to his wife, he finally convinces her to leave Michael with the grandparents, um, his wife, Lottie and Bernard, they emigrate to the United States in 1936. And Michael isn't allowed in until 1938. And in Nussbaum's writings, he, you know, he would write to his wife quite often, you know, he says, once you get to the United States, we can lobby and we can find um, doctors that will say that Michael will not be a burden um, to society. And, and so when we look at this, this will be kind of a case study of, of who was allowed in, who's not allowed in. Um, so Michael finally comes in 1938 with his cousin, uh, but they get to Ellis Island and there's, they have to stay there for two weeks. And again, um, Dr. Nussbaum and his wife, they have to lobby in Washington and they have to work really hard. And again, it, it, it begs the question, who has access to accommodations and who isn't? And, you know, all these other questions, you know, they're quite connected. 
wealthy and yet, you know, Michael's allowed to come in, but it, it takes a lot of effort, even though he's born into this family and his father is a eugenicist and it's, it has um, a lot more based in that. But then, you know, going to the students talking about what, um, you know, what keeps Michael out because the laws, you know, and what they say keeps out and, and keeps you in. And one of them is talks about physical um, differences or the word they used at the time deformities. And, but then again, Michael grows up to be a very successful lawyer in um, Washington, DC. So again, it begs the question of asking, you know, discussion with the students, well, are they right to do this? Or what is this judged on? Or who makes these decisions? So it's just a really rich nuance about the complication of eugenics. And there's one more picture, which is interesting. If you wouldn't mind going, I think it's the last slide. So this is um, Lotzi and Bernard Nussbaum, where the arrow is. So this is when they're leaving Germany. And again, they're not um, with Michael. Michael's left behind with, with the grandparents in Germany in um, not too far from Nuremberg, where these Nuremberg laws were created. So that is um, the lesson that I will be implementing with my students, eighth graders. Great. Colleen, thanks. I, I just, again, appreciate, you know, this like very, very specific case as a window into larger uh, questions about ethics, politics, power, discrimination, and ones that emits, you know, very intense debates about belonging, citizenship, <laughs> Uh, immigration, really, really continue to stay with us um, and giving your students this historical context. So really looking forward to seeing how this uh, lesson develops. Thank you, Colleen, for all this uh, great, great work. Um, Eden, I want to welcome you now. Uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right. Great to see you. Um, okay. Why don't let, I'll just invite you to the same thing, say a little bit of where you teach and we'll go to your first slide. I'm also an eighth grade teacher. And I teach here in New Haven at Worthington Hooker School. Um, and the, so this unit is, uh, the topic is links, eugenics links from the US to the Third Reich. And I envisioned it as a kind of preview or kind of coming before at the beginning of a unit I teach about the Holocaust, which is always changing as well. And I have a lot of text that I've assembled and some opportunities for students to do their own research at topics on topics that motivate them. Um, so I would start, and I, the unit is still in the planning stage, but I have some ideas here. The introduction, I would show the images of the, you know, U U Yale eugenics tree and the original eugenics tree and have students analyze them and come up with ideas of where they think this study is gonna lead us. And then I really have to credit a gifted student of mine, a former student, Margo Peterson, for introducing the topic of Malaga Island to me. Um, she uh, picked up a historical fiction book while on vacation in Maine and ended up doing an extensive primary source-based research paper that actually won her a prize for National History Day. And it was on um, the case of Malaga, which was a thriving, um, peaceful, mixed race community on an island in Maine. And it was destroyed by the eugenicists, um, by, by politicians and people in the community whose minds were poisoned by eugenicists. And actually they um, deported people from the island, they imprisoned them, they brought them to mental hospital and sterilized some of them. And it's just a horrific story. Um, it, which I expect my students to be, you know, shocked and hopefully not too traumatized by. There is an article that I found on Newzella, which is, you know, kind of a teen friendly, you know, eighth grade friendly website um, that I'm going to use for source about Malaga for them and then um, have them respond by, you know, kind of identifying what is so surprising about it and what they would like to learn more about. Uh, the next text that I identify is also a short video, and it's something I found on the Facing History and Ourselves website. And it gives a really great overview of eugenics in the United States and also ties it into, you know, how the Nazis and Hitler specifically was really inspired by American, um, American born and bred racial science. Um, you can go on to the next slide. 
So the video, what the students would watch the video, write their own questions about the video and choose a topic to explore more fully. Um, and then, you know, with the help of some of my colleagues here in our course, I did, um, you know, I, I found out about Edwin Black's book that really investigates closely how the US, um, United States science, pseudoscience um, and intellectuals were, you know, really the main source of Hitler's inspiration for um, for racial superiority and um, euthanasia for, you know, and even the use of gas and killing. And so there's a Guardian article by Edwin Black. And there's also some correspondence from um, from Minnesota, the, um, the Minnesota Eugenic Society, that's specifically where their officers write to Hitler and he writes back some notes to them. Or, um, so I'm still looking at that correspondence. And one more slide we have. So I want students to look at their own primary source images. And a couple of times I've said, well, they're gonna choose topics that they wanna do a mini research. Um, the mini research presentation on, but I also want to guide them toward, you know, really reliable websites and primary sources that I know will be rich for them to analyze. So two that I've chosen here is a photo story from um, NPR, a photo which has photos from the Fitter Families Fair exhibit. We looked at some of those in our course um, and how, you know, this was a mainstream part of American culture this idea that there were fitter families and that there were, you know, there was an ideal kind of race out there. And then finally, the um, eugenics and anti-Semitism, it's a small collection of just a few primary sources images that, again, link eugenics to anti-Semitism and to what Hitler decided to do about his um, Jewish problem. And finally, I think it's really important, to, uh, you know, with any teaching of the Holocaust, we always address, you know, why are we studying these horrific things? It's not, you know, to upset ourselves and to, um, to be traumatized, but it's really, you know, to understand things that are still going on in the present. And, you know, I love the anti-eugenics quilt um, for showing that. And there's some other really, you know, um, there's some other art that's been inspired by uh, the anti-eugenics movement and by um, memorializing people who were on Malacca Island. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a method that's frequently used to conclude Holocaust studies to perhaps students also to create works of art, to memorialize what happened in the past and to kind of really really root our commitment to not having it be you know what we do in the present mm. so that's what i have to present thank you so much for listening great um i'm gonna stop us Eden. thanks so much um for sharing that i'm just struck by a couple of things you know these local sources we don't think about coastal Maine as the site of this kind of history and violence and, you, you know, but um, it's been both richly documented and by its, the survivors and ancestors um, that their voices can also be introduced to that. Your point about perseverance, new visions of justice and, you know, almost every middle and high school class have some units on the Holocaust and the war and ways that we can link that to local history as well. So this is a fantastic unit, Eden, and really looking forward to seeing how it develops. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All right. Dora, how are you? I'm great. It's been Here. such a wonderful time seeing everybody's projects. Um, and to transition to my group, I had the honor of working with a few students and teachers during our sessions, um, who I'm going to invite as well to share what they've been working on, whether it's curriculum ideas for their classroom or for like an after school uh, organization. Um, everybody's had found a way to put what we were talking about um, and bring it to a new audience. So if I can invite as our first presenter, Tenzin. Hi, okay. everyone. Um, so my name is Tenzin Yudon and I'm a junior at Newsoms um, in New Haven Public School and I run my school's Students Organized Against Racism 
organization. Um, and this is where I decided to present my lesson plan. So I introduced the topic of the eugenics movement um, specifically by bringing up its connections to New Haven and Yale while mainly gearing the lesson towards something that students could really see the implications, like the real world implication, implications of it. So I connected it to how the SAT is inherently racist and talked more about like other tests, like the citizenship tests and voting literacy tests that reinforce these like xenophobic and anti-immigrant ideologies that stem from the eugenics movement. Um, and like other instruments like the multiple choice apparatus that was used at the height of the eugenics movement. Um, so I made sure to cater this to my audience, which was mainly high schoolers and middle schoolers by making the lesson more engaging um, so that they could understand the full impact. And I did this by making the group try to answer some questions on a literacy test or a citizenship test um, so that they can see just like the extent of like how hard some of these questions are and how even like, US citizens can't even answer them themselves. So um, as you can see, like the presentation, I have a couple questions put up there. I also um, introduced like how the eugenics had ties to Yale. And after completing this presentation, we kind of just had a discussion as a group. And I feel like it successfully conveyed like what it had to and also engaged the students because when we started talking, one student even like voiced how their own parent was going through the citizenship test process and how insightful it was to learn a little bit more about like the backgrounds and the connections to the eugenics movement and where it all stems from. Um, so that was just a brief overview of my project. You're amazing. I feel like all the ways that you were able to cater this to your specific audience through engagement um, really stand out. And it's exciting to hear that there was a lot of engagement from your audience. And I, I just want to say me personally, I really wish that I had gone to school with an organization like this and would have been able to receive a presentation like this. So thank you, Tenzin. Thank you. Um, next, we have Tina. Tina, are you here? I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're all good. Hi. Um, so uh, just a quick overview. So um, I, for, I don't know if you have my presentation and it's it's just uh i'm just gonna super quick run through it i know we were kind of running a little behind but um so i decided to come to this from the aspects of eugenics and interracial marriage particularly because interracial marriage directly affects me <laughs> as my um father is uh portuguese my mother's cape verdean from west africa so like uh just this idea of what how eugenics kind of in, in um kind of affected interracial marriage um so i'm not going to read all of that to you um um if you can go to the next slide it's just a quick do now for my students to kind of um, share their own experiences with interracial relationships most of us know at least some people who are in interracial relationships, interracial relationships, and and like how common they are now, um, and so um, for um, then I have like a, a brief overview, kind of if you you can quickly go through this 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 quick this video. You don't have to play this video because it's super long. <laughs> well, not well super long for now, but it kind of goes over eugenics, kind of what it is. I'm I'm one of the people. I'm a, a visual learner, so I usually like to have like a little clip overview of what we're doing um, and learning. And so it kind of goes over eugenics, and then it has a kind of a little bit of an explanation about eugenics. Um, so if you probably uh, actually if you go to the next slide I actually like this slide because it shows a picture of an ad in a paper where they talk about um um in the headline it says there you know how babies are to be standardized just like um pigs and cow cattle and so that p parents can actually identify mental shortcomings and overcome them so it was this idea that parents can kind of streamline their children and identify their children um for and and kind of 
weed out the bad children, I guess. I don't know. So, um, and then, you know, you can keep going through the slides. It still just kind of does an overview of, of, of eugenics. I'm old enough to remember when um, pe people had to have like the blood tests and physicals for uh, getting married. So um, this, I, this kind of goes over this idea that um, this idea that oh, eugenics kind of, and just infiltrated kind of getting married and having children. And um, so the U S pretty much had like this idea of like having, um, you know, doing nothing to kind of deteriorate the human gene pool. Right. And I, being as that my mom was pretty much a deterioration of the gene pool, like mm, that kind of, that kind of talked, spoke to my heart. So um Really, it was just kind of kind of going over the idea. Um, so if you go to uh, if you can skip one more, yeah, back up back one slide, if you could. This is like a eugenic certificate that's like, you know, oh, okay, you know, we've approved your marriage because you've fit the physical and mental balance. And um, this idea that so many people sought the certificate of sorts in which they were felt like they were okay to move forward and this idea that the eugenicists would kind of decide what we were, what was good, but usually um, it was white <laughs> and anybody who didn't have any kind of mental illness or um, any kind of physical defects. If you go to the next slide, you can see kind of where they were measuring the different, um, this one is like, uh, so they took all these portraits demonstrating like the standard head shapes of criminal types. Uh, this was taken in like France, I think it was 1914. They had different races, but all of them were um, degenerates of, as, as far as they were concerned. Like, so these are the head shapes of degenerates. So you should not be getting married. And it was, it was just all kinds of crazy. So like having that. And so then I was trying to tie it to, if you go to the next slide, I was trying to tie it to the next level, right? So we have loving versus Virginia, 1967, where, you know, um, they they impacted that. So we have a lot of, we had a lot of laws that were kind of based on eugenicist ideals and stuff. And so we had this, you know, obviously uh, Loving versus Virginia was a big case and actually broke through kind of a lot of what had happened with the eugenicist ideas of who can procreate together. So the next slide is really just kind of where we decide to like have my students kind of investigate further. They were uh, actually, I really loved the timeline that um, uh, the anti-eugenicists collective at Yale put together for like anti, it goes by decades and it breaks it out really well. So, um, you know, super quickly, if we went through the next slides, it's really, um, they have, they can go through the timeline, they can just like pick any decade that they want, and they can kind of create their own um, assignment based on what whatever it is they wanted. Um, what was really cool is that um, they, the, I, I believe the two, the, I, I probably, a lot of my students would go to the more recent decade and a lot of it was like uh, what was happening at the borders. We were having forced uh, sterilization at the borders. And um, I think that that would be really powerful for my students to see what's happening now that's still tied to the idea that we are going to forcefully sterilize children. I mean, like people were being sterilized at the border very recently. So it's it's just I think that that would be powerful for them um, to kind of see that this is all still kind of playing out right now. So. That's pretty much the long and the short of it. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Um, and I, I think you choosing this topic from a very personal perspective um, brings like a unique entryway into telling your students about like the anti-eugenic turn to this, that like everything you're showing them, despite the like horror of those images is something that you know yourself to be completely not true. Like you said, the craziness of all of it, but genuinely like the ridiculousness of it and like your existence and opposition to it. And shout out the website that I know some people have developed. Uh, next we have Dave, if you're on here. Hi everybody. Hi, um, my name is Dave Pelagi. I teach at Jonathan Little High School. Um, I teach 
music technology. I teach band. I teach orchestra. Um, right now, some of my work in my district is centered around helping um, develop a mastery-based grading um, diploma assessment or experience, as, we like, as we're trying to call it. Um, and I'm bringing uh, some of the work that we're doing here um, in this group and uh, from the RLC group that we used last, that we were in last year. Um, so, Dora, if you could just move on to my first uh, slide here. Um, I did a lot of uh, learning about Carl Seashore. Um, he was an American psychologist and uh, eugenicist um, who created a very popular musical ability test. Um, he, uh, this test is actually still used in a lot of places in the U S today. Um, it's, it was very common practice for a long time. And if you were, um, someone who went to school in the early 2000s, 90s, and even back to the seventies, um, you've probably taken this test. I know I took it when I was, uh, auditioning for schools, um, around 2012. Um, so it's, it's very, a still real thing. Um, a lot of his work was believed in that musical talents were inherited. Um, and through his research uh, and the categories um, that are listed on that artifact on the right here um, were some of the musical skills that he said were um, inherited or able to be inherited. And these categories um, were also what they measured the musical abilities on in his test and a lot of his studies. Um, so a lot of the categories that are over there on the right are very uh, was called Western classical music theory centered. Um, so essentially, they're saying that the the ideals of Western classical music um, and Eurocentric classical music were what was qualified as correct. And um, with these tests, they would essentially say other types of music were wrong. Um, and a lot of the the most glaring that you'll see in some of these is um, pitch center. So uh, underneath, you'll see that there's a um, a title of an article that uh, a, a portion of that Dr. Hosang shared with me. Um, and one of these examples the, of the pitch center was there um, in that article, and it it described um, black people and uh, to actually slaves as um, jovial and optimistic and sunny and happy. And they're the centers of most of their slave songs were of a major key. Therefore, their intellect must be at a lower level because they couldn't understand the uh, the pitch centers that were more correct in their eyes or um, bright, like a major key versus a minor key. So something as simple as that was um, pretty glaring in some of the research that we did. So um, Dora, if you could just switch over to the second slide here. Um, some of the work that I'm really trying to bring into like the mastery based things, things that we're doing in Milford are um, just a couple different ideas as far as like how we go about grading, um, especially in the arts. So um, art as a good or bad is something that we need to change as a cultural shift. Um, but especially the music education community, classical music and uh, Eurocentric music has been pushed as the correct and academic type of music for a very, very long time. And as art makers, that just can't be an option. Um, we need to make sure that we are looking all over and trying to perceive any type of music as music and not good or bad. Um, the classical music community has really been held at the peak as the peak of excellence in our culture for a really long time. And it's just really pushing all the different voices that we can learn from out. Um, a lot of teachers are already making strides in this, I find. Uh, and I know if you are looking to find somebody who's got a curriculum that's based like this, um, my colleague, Gary Nolan at Windsor High School, He's uh, doing a totally non-classical based four-year music curriculum that's all technology-based and student interest-based. And he touches on a lot of different ideas in music. So he's one of the only teachers that I've seen around that are really going on a non-Western classical based curriculum and um, not finding success, but just excelling. Um, so I think this is a really big cultural change we need to make. 
The other one that we also have to start thinking of and um, bringing into our grading policies is that people are naturally talented. Um, this is something that goes really, really into the eugenics cycle. And what most of the research was, was trying to find uh, the most naturally talented people and having them breed together to make even more talented musicians. Um, and talent levels vary, but in the last, I would say 50 to 100 years, we've made so many technological advances that um, even somebody who might not have, that would test poorly on the seashore test. Uh, there are so many more opportunities for them to learn, especially when you incorporate um, the education stylings of uh, different cultures. Um, speaking directly to uh, Indian culture, they, uh, in uh, Indian culture and teaching of music, they, um, they teach a lot more by rote as opposed to written, uh, where classical, like European, Western classical is all based on the written music and interpreting written music where um, so many other cultures, African, especially Indian, especially are uh, more rote based and everything is passed on orally. So working at an oral skill instead of visual skill, as you guys know, as teachers, for the most part, there are so many different types of learners. So opening it up to just that whole other side of people is going to make so much more art happen. Um, so our current musical culture really doesn't value that. And all of our curriculum is cir circled around making our students literate um, and reading as opposed to uh, being able to learn by rote. And uh, music teachers are trained like this. Um, so they're trained to push their musicians to rely more on their um, their written skills and their oral, their um, their tactile skills playing their reading classic literature versus finding something with your ear and being able to figure it out in your head and repeat it back. Um, and it's, it's actually pushed as like an immature way of learning music. Um, mm -hmm. So I would definitely say that uh, these three areas have been thought into our mastery based system at uh, Milford. And we are, I'm pushing in our, um, group to go against that traditional grading model as much as possible because it seems to be a little outdated, especially with a lot of this information that we've been presented in um, this group. So that's my presentation. Uh, I appreciate you guys giving me the time to say some stuff about what I learned. Appreciate you too, Dave. <laughs> and I think it, it's really exciting to hear you wanting to make these like structural based grading shifts. Um, like you said, it's going to be a cultural shift in the way we think about music and like no young person should necessarily be told that they can't make art um, because of these like outdated practices. Um, up nice. We have a student. Alice, are you here? Yes, how's it going? Um, I'm okay. Elias Theodore. Can you go to the next slide, please? Perfect. Um, I'm a senior at Wilbur Cross High School. Uh, I live in New Haven. Um, on the left is a picture of me running. I'm really into running and playing baseball. Um, and on the right is me this past summer. Um, I'm an intern at Horizons at Foot, which is a, a local organization that um, is, is a six week summer program for New Haven public school students who need extra academic or social and emotional support. Um, and through my work there, I've become interested in equity in education. Um, and so I was really excited to get involved in with, uh, with this project. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, as a Wilbur Cross student, I was really struck um, when his name came up um, in our research on the history of eugenics, just with how honored he is in our state with a road and with the name of a high school. Our mascot is the governor's and you know, as a student athlete, I rep the governors all the time. Um, and that's that's part of my identity. And so hearing that that this man who we who we celebrate so much maybe shouldn't be celebrated uh, was striking, and I want to learn more. Uh, Professor Hosang mentioned the survey of the human resources of Connecticut as one of these like kind of just like massive and looking back, really disturbing things that happened in our state. Um, and I won't go too deep into it, but it was super ambitious. It was a survey commissioned by Wilbur Cross um, and then executed and led by Harry Lawlin, uh, who, was a known, who was a known eugenicist. And 
They conducted the survey and thankfully it was never really acted upon or published, but I think Lawland's vision um, based on the information in the survey was to sterilize um, or kill or remove from the state about 10% of the population who was deemed inadequate, um, which would have just been devastating and awful. Um, and, you know, through my lesson, uh, I hope to present this. I have a biology class in mind that I'd like to present um, my research to and a history class. Um, and so I really want to localize these histories. Eugenics happened here in Connecticut. Um, you know, imagine a CT, a Connecticut, if if these men and their ambitions were realized and the survey had really been acted upon. Think about the dangers of honorific namings. Think about what it means to be a Wilbur Cross student knowing this knowledge. Um, and stress that Wilbur Cross, he could have had different opinions and he wasn't being a eugenicist isn't like of the time. There was also anti-eugenicist work happening at the time. So we shouldn't, you know, put him off the hook for that. Uh, I'd love to talk about this more if anyone else is interested in Wilbur Cross. So yeah, thank you. You're doing incredible work localizing this and I, I'm sure it will make such a huge impact on students at your school, but also I think hearing it as someone in the community, um, it is it's shocking and you're, you're delivering it really well. And the last person, but definitely not least in our group is Michelle Dunbar. We have two Michelles. Michelle, are you here? I'm here. Okay, I haven't gotten that far in my project, but it's so exciting to be a part of this group and see all the fantastic work everybody is doing. Um, I am an English teacher at Stanford High School, um, actually at West Hill High School in Stanford, Connecticut. And we are reading Lord of the Flies. And um, if you can go, I, I would like to talk to them about America's involvement in the Holocaust. And I'm looking through a number of articles and one that I'm going to, we're gonna focus on this week is white nationalism, deep American roots, a long overdue excavation of the book that Hitler called his Bible and the man who wrote it. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, students will be able to understand the role of the United States in the Holocaust, analyze the motivations and actions of American officials during World War II, and evaluate the impact of American policies on the fate of Jewish refugees and ho the Holocaust. Um, Brave New World is one of the books that we read that is actually a eugenics novel, but I don't know if the teachers at our school are presenting um, the information that way when they teach this book. So I would like to also bring this information to other teachers in my school. Can you go to the next slide, please? So we'll look at some speeches. You need a computer. I'm gonna hand out some um, documents on the, the policy, American policy towards the Holocaust, specifically this first article from the Atlantic. Can you go to the next one, please? Uh, keep going, keep going. So we're reading Lord of the Flies and the author William Golding said it was simply what seemed sensible for me to write this after the war when everyone was thanking God they weren't Nazi. I'd seen enough to realize that every single one of us could be Nazis. And in the Atlantic, uh, white nationalist, deep American roots, it talks about the uh, legacy of Mr. Grant who wrote, I'm a little nervous, sorry, uh, the passing of the great race. Madison Grant was a Yale grad. Um, and this book was also referenced in The Great Gatsby, another um, novel that I cover in my classroom. And this book went on to be Hitler's Bible. 
uh, it talks about the historical amnesia that the Americans have. It brings up the Trump campaign and the racist um, overtones in his campaign and how it relates to the eugenics movement. Grant blended Nordic bolsterism with fear mongering and supplied a scholarly veneer for notions many white people, many white citizens already wanted to believe. Grant's logic infection meant obliteration. The cross between a white man and an Indian is an Indian. The cross between a white man and a Negro is a Negro. The cross between a white man and a Hindu is a Hindu. The cross between any of the three European races and a Jew is a Jew. What Grant's work lacked in scientific rigor, it made up for in canny panic um, packaging. Nordic bolsterism with fear mongering. And that's something we saw in the Trump's campaign so to let them know the United States government has racist overtones, Petty Roosevelt told Grant in 1916 that his book showed fine fearlessness in assailing um, the popular and mischievous sentimentalities and attractive and corroding falsehoods which few men dare assail. President Warren Harding publicly praise one of Grant's disciples. Uh, we will look at the quote, the white man is more equal than the others. When looking at the 14th amendment, it failed to see a greater truth as they made good on the promise of the declaration of independence that all men are created equal. However, the white man is more equal than others. It was America that taught us that a nation should not open its doors equally to all nations, Hitler told the New York Times. Grant's philosophical framework has found new life among extremists at home and abroad and echoes of his rhetoric can be heard from the Republican base and the conservative media figures, the base trusts as well as once again in the highest reaches of government. The dangers of Grantism and its implications for both America and the world is very real. The source of greatest danger has been those who would choose white purity over a diverse democracy. And I'm going to emphasize Grant was a Yale graduate and his book was Hitler's Bible. So that's all I have so far. I have other articles that I'm going to show them and have us disseminate the information um, in groups and discuss the most powerful quotes that we take from these articles. And that's about it. That was amazing. Thank you, Michelle. I think from the very beginning when you shared that you want to do a project that connected this history to the book you guys are reading on Lord of the Flies, I was like, okay, like you have the idea, take it away. And you found like that really related quote um, and in all the ways that you're connecting this to something that's already working in your classroom is really inspiring. So this is great. I believe up next is Tenzin and Beth's group. If you two want to take it away. Nope. Absolutely. Thank oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tenzin. You're good. You're good. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you uh, for having us. I am so inspired by the presentations I have seen and am going to see. And it's just absolutely wonderful to be part of this vibrant intellectual community. So what I'm going to do is uh, take about the next minute, minute and a half to introduce the four members of our group and just let you know uh, that we do have three members of our group today. Elsa, unfortunately, was not able to join us, but I still want to give a nod to her and the work that she did put into her presentation. Um, Elsa herself, she's a New Haven resident and a senior at Hill House High School. 
and she's interested and involved in community organizing and educational racial justice efforts in the New Haven Public Schools and the broader New Haven community. In Elsa's presentation, it was a lesson plan uh, that was meant to supplement the Black and Latino Studies course that she is currently enrolled in. Our first presenter for this evening is going to be Raina Walters, and Raina is a third grade teacher at Highville Charter School, and she is a graduate of UConn School of Law, and she is now teaching as her second profession. And today, Raina, she's going to be presenting a lesson plan with an introduction to eugenics with a discussion of why the science was developed. Our second presenter is going to be Michelle Maitland. And for over 16 years, Michelle, she has been in the field of education and her positions have primarily involved teaching English as a second language and Spanish at language schools, as well as university-based uh, language institutes where Michelle has worked as an adjunct instructor in the US and abroad. And for today, Michelle, she's going to be presenting on the history of eugenics and Puerto Rican women. And our final presenter for today is going to be Christina Griffin. And Christina has been teaching for seven years. She grew up and she went to school in New Haven, Connecticut. And she has a strong desire and dedication to serve her community. And she aims to counter the negative stereotypes that have plagued the New Haven education system. And for today, Christina, she's going to be presenting her introductory work on the intersections of career privilege, eugenics, and race. And so with that introduction, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Tenzin. Yeah, um, first, can you, I'm, uh, I noticed that we were having some technical issues. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, um, I'm going to quickly, um, Reshare it and all right. Is that working better? All right, awesome. Um, so sorry about that. Yeah, so um this is Elsa and um Beth uh did a nice job of introducing uh, her and um and uh like like she um uh, like Dr. Nieves said, um she is a student in uh the Black and Latino Studies course at her school. And this is her lesson plan. Um, and it's um, relying um, on small um, class and small group discussions, videos, interactive activities um, to keep students engaged with the material. Um, and yeah, so if we could take a second to appreciate just the amount of work and um, uh, an effort that she's put into um, this uh, lesson plan, um, it's, um, including what is eugenics um, as it relates to our local histories and contemporary legacies of eugenics, as well as course connections to Black and Latino studies. And um, yeah, so with that being said, um, for our next, I'm sorry, for, uh, for our next presenter, we have Raina Walters, if you would like to take it away. Um, just let me know when to move the slides. Uh, I'm sorry, are they here? Thank you. I'm sorry, Tenzin. I hope oh, not. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Rena. Uh, I do teach third grade. So um, my first thought is to get the children to understand exactly what it is, what eugenics is, um, to have a working knowledge of it as we four away our way into conversations about race um, and why it exists today. You can you can go, Tenzin, you can go up to the next slide. So this work is complemented by a more work that I'm doing with another group, and that is presenting African-American history and some Latino history to the children in New Haven for, for our schools. There are two schools we're doing this collaboration with. So the children will be visiting sites. So this is really exciting. So we actually have this address um, for the American Eugenic Society so the children can understand tangentially what it means in their life. You can go to Tenzin. You can go. So this is, and you can go to the next slide. 
the um, this lesson is a carousel. The children will be put into groups. You can go to the next slide. And they will have these pictures to look at, to contemplate, to um, talk about what they notice and wonder. There are some guiding questions, but the hope is that inside of the groups that they can see what's inside of the these pictures, and then also understand what's outside of these pictures. And the underlining conversation is about testing um, and how um, the, this quest for eugenics has everything to do with um, a lot of the preparations that we have in class as we as we prepare for standardized testing and what that means to us and race relations. So that's my project. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And for showing how to make um, primary documents um, as uh, rich and complicated as they are accessible um, to your students. Um, and for our um, next presenter, we have Michelle. Just gonna give a second, sorry. Hello, can everybody hear me now? Uh -huh. Great, I'm sorry for the visual, I'm in transit right now. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, basically, currently I'm a teacher, ESL teacher at the Holyoke Middle School in Holyoke, Mass. And um, part of the year of my course load included teaching ethnic studies. We do have a vibrant ethnic studies program in seventh and eighth grade. And um, I have, the development of this course, the history of eugenics and Puerto Rican women, um, reproductive rights under fire. I have that in mind for the eighth graders in the future because I think, you know, being the sen sensitive nature that it is and um, adult themes that that would be the best group. And I just want to start this presentation by reading my um, blurb about um, this topic and to set the backdrop for it says the United States has contributed many positive things to the world stage. America has been known for its impressive innovations, lofty ideals, and uniquely representative form of government. It has stood as a beacon of freedom and limitless span of human possibilities. However, while endeavoring to accomplish noble feats, the U.S. has, regrettably, engaged in pursuits which have had negative consequences on certain countries and populations. One such action of the famous, quote unquote, ugly American, quote unquote, has been its veiled racist participation in the coercive population control of Puerto Ricans. And so with that being said, I just wanna take us to the beginning of what happened to the island of Puerto Rico. Um, it all started with Americans invading the island in um, approximately 1898. And um, Americans saw many wonderful, rich resources on the island, um, sugarcane, and it was like a bonanza. And so unfortunately, um, more and more control um, came over the island at the hands of Americans. And they literally, started to uproot um, the, I, I don't know if you can call them the peasant population, but farmers and um, people from their land and actually taking more and more of their land um, to the point where I'm going to cite some statistics from this eugenics archive that I came across. It said, by 1925, owing to the 1898 U.S. invasion and the subsequent devaluation of the peso and the dispossession of ranchers and farmers by U.S. sugar interest, 70% of the Puerto Rican population was landless, with 2% of the population owning 80% of the land. So you can see that um, dystopian perspective that ensued. And so as more and more Puerto Ricans ended up landless um, and maybe 
they were seen by Americans as congregating mostly in, in the city. And Americans began to think, well, the population is just out of control. We have to do something about this. And so I'm going to mention a very famous name. You, you'll definitely pick up on the last name. Um, we've all heard of Gamble, right? Procter and Gamble. Well, a man by the name of Clarence Gamble, um, he was president of the Pennsylvania Birth Control Federation, founding member of the Human Betterment League, and later um, the birthright and heir to the Procter and Gamble Ivory Soap Fortunes. He decided to fund um, doctors to be flown um, from Puerto Rico to New York to learn the latest in the sterilization techniques. This was in 1939. I have to say that in 1937, two years prior, it had become legal to have um, contraceptive use in Puerto Rico. So unfortunately, Puerto Rico started to become, um, you know, um, a test tube lab where Americans decided to practice and to, to see how the contraceptives really worked um, in live time on the island. Um, and they really used coercive mes me methods, sorry, to um, tell the women that they needed to um, have smaller families and to, because they would be able to go to the workforce and to better provide for their families. And so um, unfortunately with this experimentation, women became um, ill on the pill. There were side effects, nausea, dizziness, headaches, uh, psychological issues, which the researchers, um, Americans thought, you know, they, they just chalked it up to how Puerto Rican women were innately. And even um, incidents of pulmonary tuberculosis and congestive heart failure and who knows what else. Um, I wanted to quote from the book that we all received, um, Eugenics by Philippa Levine. It says here um, on page 70 that in Puerto Rico, almost 17% of women of childbearing age had been sterilized by 1955. So I just want to interject briefly before I turn to further slides that, um, okay, let me see. Um, further slides that I did speak with a colleague of mine at work who's Puerto Rican. And I asked her, had she ever heard of this um, term, la operacion, which in Spanish means the operation. And um, it was a movie that Tenzin sent me. It's found on YouTube, readily available. And when I watched it, it was very sickening because it talked about the, these course of measures. And my colleague said that um, she's approximately in her late 40s, early 50s, that yes, indeed, her oldest sister, about 40 something to 50 years old, had been coerced by a male doctor to just have, you know, a small family. She had already had a couple of children. And the family, uh, the doctor, I'm sorry, really, really pressured her to the point that she decided to go ahead with um, an operation. And I believe she ended up having her tubes tied. So just with that background, background in mind, I wanted to make sure that at the beginning of this um, ethnic studies course in, in regards to this topic, that we would have this history, this vital history covered so that the students would have an idea um, where we were coming from. Now, the slide that you see on the screen is I'm basically following um, a very popular format at our school, and this is known as a do now. And what I would have students do is to take a look at this very famous um, image and just um, jot, jot down really quickly, what is this picture about? Have you ever seen it before? Okay, Tenzin, we can go to the next slide, please. And then I would um, segue into a turn and talk time. And these are the questions. Do you know anyone who has ever had an operation? Have you ever had one before? If so, 
how did you feel about it? Okay. So I just wanted to extrapolate from them what were the experiences and, you know, to really bring out the point that I'm sure in, in all of this, the operations that they have had, that they gave consent um, for these things to take place. Um, we can go to the next um, slide. Okay. And this is um, that documentary, La Operación. I also stumbled across another video, thanks to Tenzin, called No Mas Bebes, which means no more, no more babies, that was um, focusing on um, Chicano women, Mexican-American women. And that is very, very, um, very painful to watch. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so very graphic images. As you can see, the women um, are missing portions of their, you know, uteruses or um, the middle portion of their bodies, just trying to drive home what has happened to women, that they've become sterile because of these procedures. Let's go to the next slide. And all of these slides um, are a work in progress. These are just some brief ideas as to what maybe one lesson plan or two could look like. I would have accompanying worksheets. But this says on the left side, esta familia planeó su futuro. So basically, um, this family planned their future. And you can see they have a nice house, nice car, and they have um, 2.5 kids. You know? <laughs> and they have a little, you know, maybe their pet there. And this side it says, esta familia no planeó su futuro. So they didn't plan their future and look what happened to them. They do not have the nice house and uh, living, they're living in very rundown conditions. The next slide, please. And so, you know, key to this course would be the, you know, um, introduction of terminology. Uh, one such word would be eugenics, which I got from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And um, uh, next slide, please. And um, we're kind of coming to the end. I was thinking um, in future lessons to have um, a bilingual approach and to um, provide words both in English and Spanish for our primarily Puerto Rican dominant population at our school. So this just, you know, touches the, you know, this is basically the tip of the iceberg for um, you know what can be done and what can be explored, but I think that um, you know I would have students incorporate um, artistic things um, into the course and to have them interview relatives, grandmothers, aunts, uncles, sisters, and people from the community about their experiences regarding la operación, because maybe the term isn't well known. But once I started thinking, talking about it in depth with my coworker, it clicked like a light bulb. She knew about this and what was going on. So in a nutshell, this is all I have to present for today. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. And um, for our next presenter, we have um, Christina. Hello, hello. Um, for the take, sake of time, I'm gonna be super quick. Um, I just wanted to preface that I, it's very, very beginning parts of a lesson plan. Um, and the reason why I wanted to explore this is because I was noticing in my classroom um, when I was growing up, um, what do you want to be when you grow up was like police officer. I want to be a nurse. You want to be a teacher. Um, and so now we're in a space where a lot of students um, want to be basketball players, football players, they want to be YouTubers, um, they want to be influencers. And so um, I would just wanted to explore like the privilege that career has um, among specific um, demographics. So I would start off um, with a do now, right? Someone else, I think, just mentioned that. Um, and so you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and so I wanted to start off with talking about what success looks like um, to the scholars and do a quick pair and share where um, I have students who are already grouped up and they were kind of sharing each other, like what a success looks like, what are some of the pathways um, to success. And then I would stop in this moment um, and talk about some of the demographics 
um, that attend private schools? Um, what are some of the barriers for those who need to attend um, private schools and how that um, affects the pathways um, where students can go, where the opportunities um, that they get to have? And then you can run to the next slide. I'm trying to go really fast. All right, you're gonna have to click a little bit like each time because there's more on this slide. So just a quick definition of um, eugenics, what it means, this is gonna be new vocabulary um, for my students. So really being able to explain in layman's terms um, exactly what it means. And so as we explore the definition, um, just talking about like, what does an improved race look like? Um, Looking at some of those words, the word improved, what does that mean? Does that mean that where we are now, there is something that, that needs to change? Um, and so kind of working through that, my class, we have a lot of like open discussion. And so I'm hoping they're gonna be able to kind of do a deep dive. And then I think if you click one more time or two more times, maybe. Yes, and so then aligning the private school versus public with opportunity, how that builds um, legacy and just showing them some statistics about how people feel um, about where they come from and how that um, opens up um, certain doors for, for, for where they can go. And I think I have one more slide um, after that. Yes, and so then we would go into a game kind of called um, Name That Career. I'm very interested to see um, how my students perceive themselves, right? So when they see pictures of themselves, versus when they see pictures of those who don't look like them, um, the career choice. So it would kind of be a game, they would have like a sticky note um, and they would have to like write down um, what career they would think the, the ladies on the left would have versus the ladies on the right. And then we would just begin to kind of explore some of those stereotypes um, that, that accompany with how people look and the careers that they have and the privileges um, that comes along with it. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. And I think that's the end of our slides. Um, so thank you to everyone that shared. Um, and I believe we have one more group. Yes, I'll just share my screen. All right. Welcome everyone. My name is Eve Galanis. I am a writer, a teacher in Connecticut, and um, a graduate student at Trinity College. Um, I've been so honored to work with this group of teachers and students. And today we're only going to have Caitlin, uh, Maddie, and Natalia present, but I just wanted to uh, highlight the people that we worked with. So our group um, was primarily concerned with uh, mental health treatment in Connecticut and at the intersection of race, class, ability, gender um, is the Connecticut State Mental Health Institutions. And so what you're looking at here is the Connecticut Hospital for the Insane now called Connecticut Valley Hospital. And without further ado, I'm just going to invite Maddie and Caitlin to share out their research. Man, is it a bummer we're going so late in the role, Maddie? I mean, everyone else had such wonderful presentations. It is such <laughs> a pleasure to be here today. Um, Maddie and I, Maddie's my student, smarter than I am. Uh, but we attend Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts High School. Uh, we're really a school right now that's moving more towards project-based learning. So hopefully our uh, presentation this evening is something that's transferable, not just for the original kind of unit we had envisioned, which is just domestic kind of World War II history, comparing kind of our um, handling as a nation for eugenics medicine uh, to kind of developments abroad, more to a project that could be used outside of a specific, maybe a, a two decade span or, or more. So without further ado, if you flip to the next slide, I'll hopefully be speedy on this, moving along in the evening. Um, like you've said, our uh, project really centers on not just using mental health as a way to kind of probe questions in eugenics, but specifically the history of the asylum. What I mean by that is state offered mental health care. So we wanted, much like other presentations tonight, to have a local history focus. Uh, the Connecticut Valley Hospital, formerly known as the Connecticut State Hospital for the Insane, was the first formal state offered mental health care uh, in Connecticut pops up in 1868, right after the Civil War, is really this response to, well, a need for a more 
centralized, should we say, offering of mental health care, something to take the burden off of towns that weren't equipped to necessarily handle kind of an influx of mental health care needs, uh, but additionally kind of an influx of private institutions like the Hartford Retreat, now known as the Institute of Living, was attempting to handle but wasn't handling effectively. But as the um, Connecticut Hospital for the Insane, again, was created in 1868 and grew through the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, it too realized that it was not equipped to necessarily handle the, the amount of people in Connecticut that were deemed just, I mean, I was going to even say, I wanted to go on a riff of what exactly mental illness looked like in the late 19th century and early 20th century, but we'll circle there again under pressures of time here. Uh, but even as other um, asylums in Connecticut open up, like the Norwich um, Asylum or the Fairfield Hills Asylum, we see that this institution, again, did not have the means to handle the population that it was given. And even though this Connecticut Valley Hospital, again, formerly known as the Connecticut Hospital for the Insane, was seen as a more functional institution maybe than Norwich and some of the scandals it got caught up in and how it handled its patients, especially again, the influx of numbers it was dealing with. Connecticut Valley Hospital, its, its predecessor is heavily influenced by eugenics medicine, by eugenics ideology. So even though the organization starts up in 1868 predating a lot of major develops, developments in Connecticut as far as eugenics goes in and outside of mental health care, Again, it's still heavily influenced by that. And we see that in the social isolation of the campus. It was meant to be its own kind of running entity separated from Middletown as a lot of asylums are seen as this reprieve from kind of urban life. And we see that, uh, you can definitely flip to the next slide. You're reading my mind there. You're awesome, thank you so much. We see that in the property just off of the main campus on Silver Mine Road in Middletown. It's just down the street from the uh, Veterans Cemetery. The Connecticut Valley Hospital Cemetery runs from 1878, a decade after the um, asylum kicked off all the way up until 1957. So again, even though it extends its life beyond the history of eugenics in Connecticut or the history of eugenics in the nation as a, as a formal movement here, 1700 patients still were buried at the site at the cost of the hospital, at the cost of the state, and are just a reminder of how eugenics medicine or eugenics thought is, is so isolating in society. You have this group of people, again, who are perceived by the, uh, the asylum as not having family or not having financial support to be buried elsewhere otherwise. So 1,700 of them, if you see, I know the photo on the right is a little hard to uh, make out there, but are buried in numbered graves as opposed to a formal grave that has their, their name or other identifying information. It wasn't until 1995 that those names were, were formally released to the public, allowing us a, a touchstone, an ability to actually research the history of the asylum from not necessarily the perspective of the patients, but from their public records, as close as we can get to, to their lived experience. As the history of the Connecticut Valley Hospital or its predecessor is inherently very, very secretive, very secluded as a lot of developments in eugenics medicine are. So hopefully our project as it develops will be able to really touch base with a lot of uh, primary source research Maddie and I have done about who these patients are, what we can see in a public record as far as the, their appearance, whether it be in other institutions or living outside of an asylum with their family, if you flip to the next slide, I've got an example of some of these uh, records. It's your standard census here. As we looked through, again, these 1,700 burials spanning from uh, 1878 all the way up till 1957, we're lucky enough if you find a census where a patient is actually, or someone who's buried here, I should say, where a patient was at the um, Connecticut Valley Hospital or Connecticut State Hospital for the Insane. At the bottom of a census listing, if you're going through Ancestry, it shows you who else was on that, that census, that roster. So this cemetery, it's the only patient cemetery in Connecticut linked to an asylum in the state, is a way for us to figure out who is actually at the asylum. So what we hope to do with this research, uh, resource, what we hope to actually bring to students going through this project-based lens is allowing them to research different types of uh, patients, different demographics of patients who are subject to eugenics medicine or subject to this organization that was heavily influenced by eugenics, whether it be looking at women, whether it be looking at queer issues, whether it be looking at race again, so on and so forth, different demographics we've explored throughout this presentation today and allowing them to build sort of pseudo biographies of these groups through the public records that we're able to find. 
But as students go through a process like this, much akin to like the Witness Stones project, a similar project as far as crafting biographies of local, local case studies, I should say, through public resources, what I hope my students will see as we employ this later in the year is the fact that there's a lot of historical silences you encounter while you're trying to do this kind of research. So, so many of these individuals, again, are, are silenced in the historical record because of their relationship to the asylum, because of their, their perception by society, whether it be Connecticut or the larger nation as being socially defective is a lot of the language that comes about. So this is where we bring in parallel stories to hopefully get students to understand, well, what was going on inside an asylum that we can't probe with the limited records we have. If you flip to the next slide, you can see examples of some of those secondary sources, but at the same time, there are traditional narratives, whether it be Nellie Bly or uh, Clifford Beers, that detail what actually happened inside of these institutions, which again, sadly, when you're researching things like what becomes the Connecticut Valley Hospital, we don't necessarily get that detail of a lens or a view into the actual day-to-day -day practices that happen in that institution from a patient perspective. On our last slide of this presentation, before I turn it over to, again, people way smarter than me, uh, the Connecticut Valley Hospital, what becomes the Connecticut Valley Hospital, still throughout its entire functioning as the Connecticut State Hospital of the Insane, it spoke very highly of itself. It framed itself as a progressive institution, but we can still see, again, based on these upwards of 1,700 patients that were buried in the cemetery without their identity from as early back as 1878, all the way up until 1995, when their identities were released to the public, that eugenics medicine is socially isolating, or even eugenics ideology that runs asylum, asylums like this, so sorry, is socially isolating. And the history of trying to break through or learn more of eugenics practices outside of mental health care is something that's hard to do without concrete sources, but there are ways around it. So hopefully this is a method of research that might be applicable to other projects and hopefully we'll get my students extra excited. Hopefully, I mean, I'm gonna let Maddie do all that good work. And that's that's awesome. That. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and yeah. I really appreciate you mentioning how difficult it is to do research on anything that has to do with um, public health or mental health and that using um, uh, census data as a way of curtailing those those barriers. So thank you. Thank you and so much. next we have Natalia. I'm here. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hey, so I'm Natalia Grant. I'm a senior at Norwich Free Academy that's in, located in Norwich, Connecticut. And I decided to do my project on the Norwich State Hospital because it's a couple blocks down the road and a lot of people in, t in the town that know that it exists, but not a lot of people know exactly what happened. So I figured it'd be an interesting topic to look into. So I really created this lesson plan as something that I, as a teacher would probably do as a class. It was definitely not really fancy. Um, I figured like if you're, cause I want to teach high school students and like maybe I figured that, you know, just thinking like what they have in mind, like what biases they have for asylums before actually like digging into what happened, like just down the street, you know? like gave them like five minutes to write down a couple words of like what they think of or phrases, you know? Oh, it's, 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 it's just a timer. <laughs> okay. So I had four objectives. I unfortunately did not manage to finish. Um, I got through, I think three, but so my objectives were, what was, what is the North Sea hospital? So like, what is it? What was happening on? What were the conditions like? How do the North Sea Hospital and other asylums represent and serve eugenic ideals? And what is the best option for its future? So I just gave a little background information about it, like when it was founded, like how it had like three name, like three or four name changes over the several years that it was opened. Um, like how many patients it had, like there was also different patients. It wasn't only mentally ill patients as well. It was, they had tuberculosis patients. They had like just people of, with old age, people that had any sort of substance abuse. Uh, and then I put when I closed, obviously. That's like a little postcard to the left. So, so I decided that maybe 
do like three options because the format was going to be like have students take notes, like some sort of guided notes. And then I would have them do some sort of activity for each of the objectives. And the first activity for the objective would either be have an open debate with the classroom where like what should happen to the building now that it's closed? You know, should because there's a lot. It's a huge controversy now, like. Uh, well, controversy, I say, but I mean, there's a lot of publication around it that I found. Like a lot of people, it's been sold for to boost the economy, like in order to build like a mall. Um, some people want to keep it alive because it's a part of history, like a really part, good part of history. Whereas other ecological um, people are looking at it and like, there's a lot of chemical waste here. We have to demolish it. So, and then I thought another option would be have students look up another asylum, like say the Middletown Asylum and compare the two, for instance, like the number of patients, the years it was open, who's being treated. And this is just basing information, like just what they know so far from like, obviously that first part. And the third one being like, just have students write a paragraph about what they think should happen. Nothing too difficult. Um, objective two. So I looked a little bit, well, <laughs> Okay. I need to pull it up again. Okay. So I looked a little bit into the conditions and obviously as Madison and Caitlin were mentioning before, there is not a lot of information about what the conditions were like from patients. I managed to find a source that was talking about how this person's grandmother and mother were in the asylums. No, her grandmother and great grandmother were in the asylums, but it didn't really have any like proof, I guess. So I didn't really want to trust it. Um, but as you can, as it first mentions, a lot of patient files or anything is banned to the public because of confidentiality, confidentiality acts. However, I managed to find a couple documents. Like one of them was talking about just the land in itself, which I'm pretty sure I have highlighted somewhere. Let's see if I can open it. It's called, oh my God. It's called the State of Connecticut, like State Board of Education, Connecticut Historical Commission. So basically they were looking into this and trying to decide whether or not it was, a it should be honored as a historical monument. And then they were explaining why. And it was back in the 80s, like 1985. And they were described, they described the place as serene and restful for the patients because it was located next to a river and it wasn't really near the town population, although it was directly located next to Route 12. So there was a bit of traffic. This was kind of busy. However, what I also found interesting was that they, in this document, they stated that they had a self-sustaining farm for food in which the patients provided the labor for food. And they were saying that helped them with their mental treatment, as in like the patients doing forced labor cured them of their mental illness, which is bizarre to me. But, and then I also found another source that was talking about hydrotherapy, which basically consisted of either spraying patients with a jet hose you know there's like images of it and it could the and with water that varied from 110 degrees fahrenheit to 40 degrees fahrenheit and somehow that would either cool them or heat them and cure them of their mental health it's weird and then i was thinking like they um break students into groups because i found a bunch of newspapers there's a newspaper article from north the north asylum called the stylus and it talks about like asylum life. It talks about, you know, pa they have like little patient sections where they're talking about um, like poems that the patients wrote and they submitted to this paper. And I feel like that would be really interesting for students to read into those and kind of like infer, like read in between the lines of like how, what the patients were feeling. And then even going even further beyond that, because the establishment has control of what's being published, like try to read in between the lines of, what's actually being published, you know, from the actual um, patients and what was just approved and pushed by the, uh, the, the upper people. Amazing. Thank you with that. Mm -hmm. it's so creative and amazing. Like eons better than I was <laughs> at the start of my teaching career. So thank you so much, Natalia. Thank you, everyone in my working group. And I'm just going to pass it on to Dr. Hosang. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so amazing. I, yeah, I just can't imagine like doing the um, 
or, or how much I would have benefited as a high school student getting that. Um, we're a little behind time. We're grateful for everyone's patience, amazing presentations. Tom, I'm going to turn it back to you now uh, for just a quick word to close us out. Uh, to the working group members, grateful for your time, energy, insights. We're going to stay connected, keep going, and uh, keep up this important work. Tom, over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, all of you. I just want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the team that put this together, uh, Dan Hosang, uh, Eve Galanis, who you just saw, Dora Gall, uh, Beth Saida Nieves, uh, Tenzin Donup, uh, who helped with all the uh, tech stuff, and our guy at the Gilder Lerman Center, uh, uh, Daniel uh, uh, Vieira who um, you know, helped uh, bring everything together. This is a project, the Black and Latino History Project that's funded. This is where we roll the credits. Uh, it's uh, organized by the Gilder Lerman Center. I've got, I hope you can see it, all of the links on that. Um, it's funded by Connecticut Humanities. You know, it's based, uh, I should say, on um, the new uh, Black and Latino uh, curriculum curriculum, but with a twist, uh, we did not see why it should be limited just to high school. Uh, and it's really great having uh, elementary school teachers, middle school teachers, high school teachers, as well as students involved in creating these kind of projects. Uh, some of you at the beginning may have wondered what this had to do with Black and Latino or Latinx history. And I think, you know, just listening to everyone, you can see why that was the case. Um, uh, we are uh, not quite finished with the project. I hope you can go visit the website. But our next one is going to be on the Great Migration. And we're looking at both Black and Puerto Rican migration uh, with an emphasis on that migration to Connecticut. Uh, we still have a few spaces available. So if any of you want to contact me to find out more about that, you're welcome to do that. And again, thank you uh, uh, for staying uh, with us. And thanks again to everyone involved. Uh, and it'll be online, uh, so you can check all these and scribble down all the great ideas that have been presented uh, tonight. And again, I want to thank uh, everyone involved in making this such a wonderful event. Thanks, everybody. Good night.